All right, here's our lab preview video for the infratemporal fossa. Um, this is a pretty fun dissection for a future dentist. Um, you're going to see a lot of the nerves that you do um, anesthesia with. Um, uh, so what we're going to have to do is, um, we're gonna, in the big picture, we're just going to go deep into the face um, from the lateral view. That's where we're headed today. Um, we're going to want to start by taking all of these facial nerve branches that your group dissected last week, um, and we're going to want to de detach them distally, but leave them attached proximally, and reflect them all out um, so that we can get access to this deep space without damaging um, the nerves. And we're definitely going to want to do this bilaterally. Um, the going deep into the face, um, it. The, it's hit or miss on, on what structures you're going to get on the inside, so you definitely want two chances on this. Also, by doing both um, both sides, you're going to have a lot more mobility for the mandible, so you'll be able to simulate some procedures a little bit better. So we'll definitely want to do both sides for this, this um, particular dissection. So um, get your facial nerve reflected. Uh, I'm just going to pull it out of the way entirely. Um, and then the, if you have a transverse facial artery, go ahead and reflect that as well. Um, so we're really look, trying to get to the point where we're looking at a bare masseter. Um, we also want to expose temporalis entirely, so remove all of the fascia covering that muscle um, so you can see um, the muscle fibers. Um, since the brains have been removed, this will be cut off about here, so you won't have all of the temporalis, but you do want to get, get it to where you can really see that muscle and it's um, it's wide-ranging muscle fibers. Um, this is what gives you the clues about the function of temporalis, that there's fibers that are oriented like this versus fibers oriented like this. Um, okay, once we get that sorted out, um, we're going to want to um, cut through the, um, the zygomatic arch using a saw. Um, so we're going to make want to make a cut here, posterior to the masseter, and then a cut up here um, in a perfect world, we want to come straight across here, right to the um, right anterior to the attachment of the masseter. Um, sometimes that's not possible because the masseter attaches so far anteriorly. Um, and we definitely don't want to take our saw cut so far medial that we end up in the maxillary sinus or the orbit. So um, if you have to come back a little ways, that's fine. Just sort of cut through the bone with the saw here and then detach the masseter with the scalpel. Um, for this portion right here. So that you may have to sort of um, gauge that as you go. But the idea is that by cutting this segment of the zygomatic arch free, we'll be able to reflect it down with the masseter. The masseter will remain attached here at the angle, um, but it'll sort of reflect it down and out of the way, giving us access to the deeper space. So this is sort of what that, um, when the, all that stuff's out of the way, what we're going to look for. You will actually see bare mandible uh, after that step is finished. Um, then we'll, be, we'll sort of identify the coronoid process, um, the attachment for the temporalis muscle, um, because that's the next thing we're going to cut. With the bone saw, you're going to want to cut across um, the coronoid process. Um, we're going to cut across the neck of the mandible, and we're going to cut horizontally across the ramus. And um, the dissection video makes a big deal about trying to figure out exactly where the inferior alveolar nerve goes into the mandible so that you cut above that point. Um, I found it's kind of tricky to really get that, uh, and it seems like you have just about as good as luck by just guessing. Um, if you aim for a plane that you know is about the position of the maxillary molar teeth and just go work your way straight across, that usually is safe. Um, and then if you cut this, we're basically we're just cutting out this window of mandible and you can pop that out and take a look at what you've got. If you want to cut more, you can certainly do that in a second cut. Um, but that's where we're headed is, is deep to this ramus. So we're going to take out that section. Now, I can't take out that section in this program, but so I'm just going to pull the whole mandible away briefly. And what you'll see right away it just looks like a big mess. I mean, that is just so much stuff. Oof. So I would start by um, going ahead and removing veins that you see in here. Um, all these veins of the pterygoid plexus, um, these, are, these are messy. There's many of them. They all intermingle. Um, any of the veins that you see in here, you can start to remove. Just bit by bit, one by one, just get them out. Um, you can get all these veins out of here. And then you're at least seeing one less. Oh, I didn't mean to take that. Um, you're, you're at least seeing one thing less than you were seeing in there before. 
Um, so then you just have arteries, nerves, um, and muscles. So um, once you got all those veins out, um, you probably want to sort of try and figure out what what's what in this space. And the, probably the most important helpful um, orienting feature will be the pterygoid muscles. Um, the lateral pterygoid, um, which is above and is essentially horizontal, running from the pterygoid plate to the neck of the mandible. Um, and then the medial pterygoid, which runs from the ter lateral pterygoid plate, medial side, um, down to the angle of the mandible. So this, this is the mirror image muscle of the masseter. Um, if you can picture um, the mandible here and then the masseter over here, these two are kind of mirror images of each other on the opposite sides. So um, yeah, try and visualize medial and lateral pterygoid. There will be some nerves, arteries, um, you know, hopping around um, in the, their vicinity. But if you can figure out those two muscles, that's going to be a really important starting point. Um, because this space between the lateral pterygoids, um, probably what is most important about that space for you is that's where you can access the nerves of V3. Um, so if you are um, doing anesthesia, you're passing a needle through this tissue and then into this space to try and hit these nerves here. Um, so the two that will really pop out at you most likely will be the inferior alveolar nerve and the lingual nerve. Those you two run in parallel. They pass from between the two muscles um, and I think they're usually pretty big so you don't have a problem seeing those two if you, um, if you have the orientation to the pterygoids. You may also have the buccal nerve. Um, I will warn you that the buccal nerve is often um, associated with t touching um, this temporalis tendon. Um, so it, when you were working on the temporalis tendon before, um, and let me see if um, this go if I go back one step, um, if the temporalis will come down and show that relationship. Yeah, there we go. Um, it tends to be right up against um, the temporalis tendon as it inserts down onto um, the coronoid process of the mandible. So you might want to just preventatively look ahead on, that, on, on the inner side of that temporalis tendon um, and see if you can push that buccal nerve away. Um, we'll probably try to help you do that as you go. Okay, so you may like be able to start sort of on a high note by identifying these three different nerves of V3. Um, and then you're going to want to go ahead and um, is now that you've identified lateral pterygoid, you're going to want to completely remove it. Um, so there should be no lateral pterygoid left in order to provide access because we need to see where these nerves came from. So um, by removing the lateral pterygoid muscle, um, that's going to allow you to follow these nerve branches back to the point where we actually get to the stem of V3. Um, and that's going to allow you to see, you probably won't actually be able to see foramen ovale where these things pass through. Um, but you'll be able to get quite close um, and visualize it. You probably won't see the otic ganglion, which is usually associated with the medial side of the V3 stem, um, but uh, you'll, the goal is to get to the point where you can see these nerves coming together. If you're at that level, then you can probably also see the auriculotemporal nerve, which is branching laterally from the V3 stem. Um, this is the nerve that sort of wrapped over to the lateral side of the face. It gives you a branch to the TMJ, the articular branch. Um, so try to identify that. And then, then you've identified the major sensory branches of V3. Then all we have to do nerve-wise is find a couple small branches. Um, and the first one's right in this area. Um, and this is uh, the corda tympani branch of facial um, is emerging back here from the petrotympanic fissure. And then it's coming down and joining up with the lingual nerve. Um, and then these two are ba essentially running together all the way to the oral cavity. Likewise, if we follow the um, inferior alveolar nerve down, um, we can find where the small um, mylohyoid nerve or nerve to mylohyoid branches from it um, before it enters the mandible. So um, that, that wraps up the branches of V3. Um, we almost found all of them outside of the other uh, motor branches. Um, there's also some work to do in this space on the maxillary artery and its branches. Um, there's many branches of the maxillary artery, as you'll find out in lecture, um, but we only want to find um, like sort of a four representative branches. One of them is, is probably going to be pretty easy to find, the inferior alveolar artery, since it um, comes down and is associated with the inferior alveolar nerve. They both go into the mandible and the mandibular foramen, so um, they should look quite similar. 
Um, another branch that we're going to try and find of maxillary is um, the uh, middle meningeal artery, which um, goes up and deep uh, into the base of the skull. Um, it goes through foramen spinosum and is often closely associated with the auriculotemporal nerve. Um, sometimes the auriculotemporal nerve even splits in half and wraps around the middle meningeal artery. Um, these two are really the closest of friends. All right, um, next from the maxillary, um, we're going to look for some deep temporal branches. These would represent, um, these first two were representatives of, say, the first part of the maxillary artery. These would represent the second part of the maxillary artery, um, the arteries that don't have to go through skull foramina to get to their targets. These are actually supplying the muscle mastication. So in this case, um, the deep temporal arteries are supplying the temporalis. So you'll find those um, running superiorly towards the temporalis. And then um, the last maxillary artery branch that we're going to try and find comes off the maxillary um, and then runs right down into uh, and disappears uh, into the maxilla because it's supplying uh, maxillary molars. This would be the posterior superior alveolar artery. So this one's quite short. It just sort of hops into the bone and then disappears. Um, so that's, um, that's sort of our maxillary story. There's many more branches, but this is the ones that I think you can probably find most reliably. You should probably also follow the maxillary artery back and try to um, clearly demonstrate where the maxillary artery and the superficial temporal artery bifurcate um, and come back together here to form the external carotid. Um, if you can demonstrate continuity between the external carotid here and the external carotid down in the neck, um, that's going to serve you well in your overall understanding of the head and neck anatomy. All right, um, the last objective of the lab is to identify uh, to identify the articular joint, uh, the TMJ. Um, the chances are there's a pretty thick articular capsule surrounding the head. Uh, remember, we cut away this section of the mandible, so the head and neck are probably just hanging here. Um, the, probably the easiest thing to do is just to, um, just to totally disarticulate this joint and pull the joint out um, so that you can actually see um, the articular disc of the temporomandibular joint um, and then the space above the disc and the space below the disc um, which are those superior and inferior cavities that account for the different types of movement at the TMJ. So um, that's our lab on the infratemporal fossa. Um, I hope you enjoy it and um, make some memories for your dental practice.